Thank you. Um, what is the diagnostic decision support by computer education or phenotyping? I've heard a lot of this by Tsuchiyanji, so I will quickly answer this question. Um, many patients feature characteristic facial distance. For example, anyone in this room can tell that this actress has a Down syndrome, and um, this is obvious from her face. And Professor Werner Gatz, back in 2016, Dr. Werner Gates and colleagues, we suggested to use computer vision and machine learning to create a um, diagnostic decision support system that automatically suggests potential differential diagnosis. So you enter a photo, the computer will detect the face on that photo, it will process the facial features and analyze them by a deep neural network. Doing so, it will compare the photo to a very large database of images of patients with craniofacial dysmorphisms and provide you with a list of potential differential diagnoses. In this case, it correctly suggested Cornelia de Lange syndrome as the most likely one. This technology now became Tastogen's deep gestalt. And in, like any other medical testing, um, this raises one single question, and that is how accurate is deep gestalt? We've just heard that question. Um, uh, as there is no class in conspicuous space in deep gestalt, that is, it is not trained to discern affected from non affected individuals. You have to bear in mind when answering this question that it will always return a score. For example, in my case, it suggests spinal cerebellar ectasia and angel medicine. Although my colleagues always tell me that I am a bit clumsy, I do not think that I have this disease. And this means this is a shortcoming of deep stuff. You have to use it with caution because it cannot tell you that someone has nothing. However, and that's interesting, the score yielded is low. This means there is a potential of the two to discern affected from non-affected individuals. We tested this hypothesis and the tool's accuracy on 17 different syndromes. We collected 19 photos of each syndrome and matched them to, by age, sex, and ethnicity to a cohort of unaffected individuals. So in total, our test cohort contained 646 images. And um, when we ran all the um, affected individual images through deep gestalt, we saw that the scores actually varied. That's something that surprised me. Not all of them yielded high scores, although all of them showed affected individuals. Some yielded low scores. Nevertheless, they tend to be higher in affected individuals than they tend to be in unaffected individuals. But still, the separation is imperfect. We also tested the tool sensitivity, and we found that in 60% of the cases, the correct diagnosis is positioned on the first rank. That means the uh, correct diagnosis is the first one in your uh, results list. And in 90% of the cases, the um, correct diagnosis is still among the first 10 suggestions, which is pretty good. However, this sensitivity depends on the, tool, uh, on the symptoms of the affected individual. In creature Collins syndrome, the sensitivity is higher than in Lois Deep syndrome, which one would expect as creature Collins syndrome is more dysmorphic than Lois Deep syndrome. <coughs> we recent, just recently also tested whether this is true not only for the sensitivity, but also for the accuracy of the tool, and that's actually the case. So sometimes the accuracy is only moderate, in other cases it is um, high, and that depends strongly on one single parameter, and that is the diagnosis of the effect. So we've just heard from Tsung Shen about Gestalt Matcher, and that brings me to my next question. How accurate is Gestalt Matcher in comparison to Deep Gestalt? So Tsung Shen already explained this, so I will go through this quickly. Um, Gestalt Matcher uses the last layer of the feature encoder of Deep Gestalt to create a clinical face phenotype space, and the distance of two images in that space can be used as a new similarity score. And this should enable the tool to classify more syndromes than deep gestalt, and it should even enable gestalt matcher to match individuals that have an as yet undefined diagnosis. So our team immediately started testing this, and we found that while deep gestalt can classify 330 images, gestalt matcher can indeed classify 1,133 uh, syndromes. Sorry, syndromes. So in here, then. Yeah, Start Matcher keeps its promise, it classifies more different kinds of syndromes. We also had a look at the sensitivity of the Start Matcher and we found that it is comparable to that of Deep Gestalt. This is something that actually surprised me. As the Start Matcher is prioritizing syndromes from a larger pool of 
from a greater number of syndromes, it should be harder for, to, to put the correct diagnosis at the top. But still, the top 30 suggestion is nearly, oh, top 30 sensitivity is nearly the same as in deep discard. So it works pretty good. We've already seen that, um, that um, deep gestalt cannot properly compare, uh, co properly separate affected and unaffected individuals. And we tested this on gestalt measure as well. And here, gestalt measure two fails to achieve the task. But that's because gestalt measure and deep gestalt, neither of them were trained to achieve this task. It's not their objective. We've tested this not only on their top one scores, but also on their top 30 scores. And we found, again, that scores of affected and unaffected individuals are similar. That you saw unaffected are shaded in lighter colors, affected in darker colors, and you see that they um, strongly overlap. And what I, caught as, what I thought was surprising is that although the technologies are based on, at the core of the same uh, algorithm, the calibration is different. So gestalt measure scores tend to be higher than deep gestalt scores. As we've seen, and it always suggests a syndrome, we've tested what syndromes it is that the tool suggests. And so um, on the, on the x-axis, you see the false positive rates of the syndromes by deep start. On the y-axis, you see the false positive rates by the start matcher. And what we saw is that if the syndrome is likely to be falsely suggested, frequently falsely suggested by deep start, it's also um, frequently suggested by the start matcher. However, and that's important to note, the majority of syndromes that these two can classify show low false positive rates. For, so for these, they work pretty well. Nevertheless, there is a group of syndromes that feature high false positive rates. And when we had a closer look at what syndromes these actually were, we found that the single syndrome that featured the highest false positive rate in either two was angel neck syndrome. And now think again of the image of me. Angel neck syndrome was one of the uh, suggestions. So this has nothing to do with my face. It's because the tools are biased towards this suggestion. So we wondered, is it possible to more accurately discern inconspicuous controls from patient images? Back in 2020, we already suggested that it should be possible to use the output of deep gestalt put it into a support factor machine and calculate a single score that then would be a measure of a, the degree of facial dysmorphism to close this diagnostic gaps of the tool. This idea was taken further by the developers of Gestalt Measure and Deep Gestalt, and they trained it in a more sophisticated model and on a by far larger uh, data set, and they called this new tool D-score. And indeed, D-score yields low scores in unaffected controls, they, are, they tend to be zero, and high scores in affected individuals, they tend to be one. We did not only test this on our test set, we also tested this on images um, from the London Dysmorphology Database that were not part of the training set of Deep Gestalt or Gestalt Measure, and we found that these patient images also featured high scores. The same was true for more than 4,000 images from the Gestalt Measure data. So this would be the diagnostic accuracy of the start measure when comparing the power to discern uh, affected against unaffected individuals. That would be the one of deep gestalt, and this would be the one of D score. So D score indeed outperforms the other ones and has the potential to close this diagnostic gap. We tested D score for potential biases, and we found that in um, patients aged zero to two years, that is babies and toddlers. And the um, accuracy was pretty good, so it was able to discern the two um, classes. It was even better at age um, 3 to 10, still very good in, in teenagers, and it started to struggle beginning with young adults, and the older the individuals were, the harder it was for um, D-score to discern affected from non-affected individuals. This means it works best at the age group 3 to 10 years, and that's pretty good because that's the age group we usually see in our genetic department. We also tested with a sex potential bias of this tool, and we found that indeed in males, they tend to be healthy males, so HM is healthy males. In healthy males, we find um, higher scores than in healthy females. I think that's due to facial hair. We're not sure about this yet. We're going to further investigate this. But still, in males and females, the tool works and is able to discern affected from unaffected. The same was true when we tested um, for ethnicity as a potential bias. 
here I have to say that 84% of our test data were labeled by our team as either coming from white individuals, so we probably will need more um, data of a more diverse testing population. What I really liked about the tool is that you cannot only use it to rate an individual's degree of dysmorphism, but you can also use it to determine the degree of dysmorphism of an entire syndrome. So here you see the scores. Um, uh, separated by, their by the syndrome of the affected individuals, and we, um, uh, we, we ordered them according to the median value. And you see that Lois Dietz syndrome is at the left, while Preacher Carlin syndrome is at the right. That's exactly what we would expect, as Lois Dietz syndrome is the one that is, is rather mildly dysmorphic, and Preacher Carlin syndrome is very dysmorphic. So this shows that the two does what it should do. So to conclude, both Gustav Metzger and Dieter Stahl are sensitive tools. But they were not designed to discern patients from healthy controls, and therefore they are not specific, specific meaning um, they cannot um, discern affected from unaffected individuals. The tool's accuracy depends on a patient's diagnosis. The start measure can aid in the identification of more diagnoses than the start. B score has the potential to increase the specificities of the other two systems when used in a stratified manner. Yeah, thanks for the results, very interesting. Um, I mean, I think it's not a surprise that uh, you are scored with Angelman if you are smiling. And I yeah. wouldn't um, <laughs> refer to it as a bug rather than a feature because it's a feature you also pick up in happy puppet syndrome, right? Okay. Um, but on the other hand, um, if you score high with D score, what does it actually tell you? I mean, isn't that a step back in explainability. Uh, I mean, this is what AI needs to move to, right? Mm -hmm. Explaining the results. And, and this is just a summary of some um, one-dimensional scale. You, you, you reduce it to one dimension, and you just argue it scores higher in dysmorphism. Mm -hmm. What does it tell you? So uh, I take this as two questions. The first question is, is it relevant that um, the tools suggest angel men frequently? And is maybe is it only because I'm smiling on the image? That is actually true. I also think it's because I'm smiling on that image. But as you can see in the, in the plot where we plotted it, that's not only true for my image, but for the majority of the images, more than 80% in our data set. This means people tend to smile when you take a picture of them. Mm -hmm. That's also what patients do when you take pictures of them in the clinic. And therefore, although it is not a bug of Facebook gene, it's something, it's a bias we have to deal with when we use this tool as a diagnostic decision support system. The second question is what would be the benefit of the added value of uh, a D score? And I agree that D score, especially when you're a trained geneticist that's very, who's very experienced, then maybe D score is not needed. But Facebook gene aims and tools like Facebook aim to reach a broader audience. They are made not only for geneticists, but also for pediatricians, and they also um, um, are available in areas where you do not have um, highly sophisticated medical systems. And there, I think, there we can use D-score when people wonder, I'm taking a picture of an individual and it tells me there's a certain syndrome, is it necessary to further refer this uh, individual to a specialist? And that's where D-score comes in. Tell you, okay, maybe, yeah, it makes sense. Ask a geneticist to help further work on this. Or no, there's no need to do this. Thanks so much, Martin. In the interest of time, we have to move on. We thank the speaker.